By the way, that's how I did dig into Yes once I decided to. I uh, fell in love. I listened to Close to the Edge on at uh, probably like a listening station in music shop. Mm, and the then I thing? bought um, probably the side one. And I was like, oh, I need to get into these guys. <laughs> Hey there, welcome to Feedback Def. I'm Sabi RK, and I'm very happy to be joined by special guest, Jimmy Usher. And we're going to be geeking with Jimmy on the Yes album 90125, which uh, celebrates, I guess, its 40th anniversary on November 11th, 2023. So, Jimmy, I'm just going to go ahead and give you the floor and get your thoughts on Please, this record. Sure. Yeah, well, hi, Sabi. Thanks for having me. This is great. Of course. Thank you for, I'm a big, for doing big, this. Of course. Yeah. Oh, it looks like we wore the same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, for, all the, for all the listeners out there. Um, yeah, so we. Um, I'm a huge Yes fan. Uh, I, was, I was happy to... Uh, you kind of reminded me that, oh, yeah, this album's coming up on a huge anniversary. Um, a controversial kind of Yes album and so much of a Trevor Ra- uh, Rabin album, really. Um, but yeah, it's like we find this classic band at a at a re uh, structuring point, and some of my favorite bands really take that serious. They they kind of keep up with either I, I would I don't want to say keep up with the times, but they uh, at least evolve in their own way. And I think this is a huge weird evolution point for this band. Um, and I'm sure I'm not alone, but this is my first introduction. Yes, owner of a lonely heart um child of the 80s myself so i don't know if that really counts when do you when do you uh, i was probably seven by the time i was seven in 1990 so when do the when do you get to what album what what era do you get to claim i don't know i mean you, you know i would say you're more you are literally a child of the 80s but you're you're you grew up in the 90s but you yes yeah yeah that that sounds right but yeah, Owner of a Lonely Heart, their biggest hit 15 years after their formation. And um, that's the first thing. I, I grew up uh, learning learning music through piano lessons and things. I'm a guitar player now, really, primarily. But um, sitting there with synthesizers and keyboards, you eventually come across that orchestral hit patch that's on every keyboard in the 80s. And that's when my dad or uncle would be like, hey, uh, yes. I was like, yes, what do you mean? And they they would show me Owner of a Lonely Heart. I probably didn't rediscover Yes until maybe two decades later when I got really into the Mars Volta. <laughs> mm. um, their album, Deal Out in the Comatorium, that's probably early 2000, maybe 2001 or two. Um, I had followed at the drive in their pre, the, you know, Omar's uh, previous band tightly, and this is, they, they kind of reformed as a prog group. I fell in love with the Mars Volta. Everyone kept telling me you need to hear yes. And I'm like, owner of a lonely heart, those guys, I don't see the connection, but um, that's what kind of had me dig back into the old early days of yes. I fell in love and eventually, you know, you just keep searching for uh, finding that high that you did with the first couple of records you hear from, from yes. Like for me, it was fragile, close to the edge. I loved those. And then, you know, tearing through their catalog, you finally get to this, this really unique album of theirs that is yeah definitely it it, it makes me think a lot about you know we were talking uh, i was already talking about but bands that evolve and i think the, the police keeps coming to mind for me with this one another band that sort of <clears throat> came into the 70s one way and then uh, survived through the 80s a different way um, they had a much more gradual mm, you know evolution they they, they were always a uh, high-end musicians like jazz fusion guys that came in sort of on, in disguising themselves as punk rock, at right. least for a record or two um, before they kind of start to really shift more into that. I don't know, uh, new, uh, new wave world music that they end up at synchronicity um, and listening through some of uh, Trevor Horn, the producer of 90125 um, listening through some of his interviews, he even referenced, Oh yeah, we were, you know, looking for the right snare sound. We kept referencing synchronicity and um, things like that. So yeah, it's a, it's a delight of a 
of an oddity, I think, this record. And I think it holds up, you know, um, falling in love with classic. Yes, I went through the the shock that everyone did in the 80s of like, whoa, this is a big turn. Um, and now with even further um, distance and time uh, and and revisiting it for this anniversary, it's uh, I think it's really charming and special. I I agree. And my first exposure was also owner of a lonely heart. I was whatever uh, age nine in 1983. And that song was so like all over the radio. And I, it was like, I, I was so unfamiliar. I remember asking one of my older friends on my block in the South Bronx, who I shared a lot of music with a, a guy I was really close to at the time. And I was like, wait, 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 owner of a lonely heart is that the romantics? And he's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like uh-huh. that's yes. Uh-huh. Cause I would get them confused in my head. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, that's one of those songs for me that I never get sick of and don't feel any, um, feel like anything is diminished from it being so overplayed. It just doesn't ever lose its, it's. I mean, I I feel like even get, getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Like the 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 sound of it, and the right. the just the way it, it's it's such a beautiful sonic space you're getting into, and the hook and everything, and and um, yeah. I so I had no concept of prog rock at that age. I wouldn't have even known what that was. I mean, I I think at nine years old wouldn't have even known who Led Zeppelin was yet or anything sure. like that so then i like you i went back and you know they they had a similar kind of it's interesting because they, they were prog but they had a similar mm-hmm. kind of radio presence in the pop radio format of the early 70s too yeah and then they do it again in the 80s and I also think the story is pretty remarkable because it wasn't ever intended to be a yes album until basically ahmed yeah. Ertigan, you know, until Ahmed Ertegun from Atlantic was like, yeah, we got to call this yes. Cause I mean, right. I don't know if you got to listen to my interview with Trevor Rabin from the day before yeah. we were taping this. There's just no way that would have drawn as much attention had they called that project cinema. It's, it would have gotten some attention, but there's no way it would have had right. as much traction. But it is a real radical departure. Now, you. I just listened to Tormato for the first time this morning. Sure. I just never An- another one that's kind of a controversial one for them. Well, Weirdly, why, why, why would you say that is? Because I was surprised at how much it slots in very nicely with everything else up to that point. Yeah. Well, actually, you know, when I say that, I think I'm calling out um, the yes fandom um, take that it's kind of like whoa what is this we this is a big shift with them as much as much as much distance as you and i have now in the future i i agree tomato and drama uh the two previous yes records to 90125 they really do to me still kind of fit in um with that era i i you know they're always kind of getting compared to close to the edge or fragile or relayer is a lot of people's favorite um yes classic prog era stuff and i don't know man this stuff is up there uh, maybe it doesn't maybe it doesn't have as many uh, hits per track uh as far as like okay this one i skip a little this one i play a little more but yeah man i i, I still dig that era i really think a lot of the um controversial takes that are out there that maybe i'm kind of distancing myself from here really have to do with lineup changes and loyalty things um, also just the ever growing from the seventies, right through the nineties, the ever growing divide of what is and isn't commercial art and who is, or isn't selling out or whatever. Um, because yes, has this, um, you know, like I keep saying, there's so many bands that evolve in sound, but yes, had this backwards that like talk, talk, for example, they're a band that has huge radio success early on and then goes on to make really critical uh, critically acclaimed records and departing from pop. Um, and this is almost a reverse thing where like, not that yes was in obscurity very early on, they had the radio stuff, but through most of the seventies, that sound and that style of rock and roll is 
slowly fading in in popularity and um i don't know i think that maybe some of the narrative around it is 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 them grasping for straws with change but to me i just look at that as really um artistic evolution and once you get to yes i did get to to listen to you know your talk with trevor and once you hear sort of his approach to all of this I definitely see how organic this all this all this change happened. This thing looks like radical change. It really was an organic thing from based around him. I mean, he's a he's a hot shit artist out of South America at the time, uh, South America, South Africa, <laughs> <laughs> and and he knows it and he's great and he's confident and he says in your conversation with him that about you know he, he's like I didn't really care about Prague or or heavy metal that wasn't my cross to bear. Um, he just was a, a great musician in the in the sound of the time that was evolving into the 80s. Like, yeah, this is the kind of sound that's going to stick around. And he's right in there um, with his style, his approach, his fire, his, his guitar tone. Um, so when he shows up and this very much becomes an organic get together with some of some yes, ex members, some ex yes men. Yeah, you can totally see that this is where the controversy steps in. It organically becomes its own thing. And eventually, because a few parts shift around, it does end up being called yes. And maybe that's where some people struggle to to get on board. And you hear in, in your conversation with him, Trevor's own little frustration, even though he understands the the the, the blessing that it was to to call it yes and and um you know all the, the good things that come with that. Also, the struggle of, oh, now I'm taking on, I have to play a bunch of the old songs where you have to contend with the old fans. Um, that was a, a struggle for him. And man, there's, um, I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there's an old, it's not very long, maybe 10, 15 minutes. It's like a behind the scenes documentary footage style. I, apparently, Steven Soderbergh shot this. It's like backstage oh. with Yes during the... 90125 American tour dates. I think he filmed that whole I'm pretty sure he filmed that whole um the the long form concert video from that that ended up on record really? as an EP 9012 live oh, the cool. solos which I actually love that EP uh which we, we can get into but um I'm pretty sure he filmed that whole thing. And so that probably okay. is part of what the, I've never yes. seen that vid- that whole video I've only seen like bits of it. Well, there's uh yeah, I did I didn't know that until I was just kind of dicking around through some of this stuff uh, for this the conversation. Is it? Oh yeah, look, Steven Soderbergh shot this, so you get to see the band hanging before they get on stage and after, and you can also see Trevor at the time having his um, struggles with it. You know, he's the one that is when they get off stage a little critical of, hey, we should do this a little different, we should take it that way. And you see him, I would say, he doesn't say these words, but struggling under the weight of of what yes is. And it's, but it's really kind of like his vision is at the heart of this, but it's a collaboration. And then, you know, Trevor Horn in the mix is another sort of uh, voice in this, in this thing that makes this, makes, makes up uh, this sound. And yeah, that many strong collaborative voices, you can see, you know, that's, that's a tough, tough uh, road to, to, to walk down when you're trying to satisfy that many um inputs and egos in the room but plus at the, the end record of it, label. you know that's what plus yes plus, plus the <laughs> market pressure and and i and i believe their management also everybody had to be seeing dollar signs here and like look we can't this is this is a no-brainer as much mm-hmm. um not to cut you off but as much as much um sort of um purist blowback there's going to be we, <laughs> this is from a marketing perspective we can't yeah. do I, I bet you my guess is that Ahmed Erdogan was like, yeah, I'll let them think they're making the choice. But at the end of the day, if I have to, I'm going to tell them. And I don't know that for a fact, but I can't imagine he sure. would even, if, if he even let them call this anything else. Sure. Yeah, it's it's a, I get it. It's a smart move. And for a band that is from the very beginning saying our thing is we're pioneers and we take risks why not take this risk? That's what I, I, you know, this is, I, I, I defend this record. I probably still have other favorite yes records, but I think that this is, I mean, we talked about owner of a lonely heart, but I love the other single off it. Leave it. That is sick. <laughs> um, it's a little less right down the owner of the, of, the, of a lonely heart is really has that eighties sound. Mm-hmm. I think some of the other tracks on here, 
while they still keep that maybe 80s snare and guitar tone, they still have interesting departures and and go into some other places that isn't just like, you can't just throw it in the pile of like uh, 80s hair rock or anything like that, you know? No, they're Leave rock. Is there's like, really there's, awesome. there's, there's rock on this record too, as much as there is really sort of solid, elegant pop music. My mm-hmm. favorite song is uh, Hold On. Actually, the, the, the first oh, two cool. songs. I love that song. I love the idea of that song. It's so encouraging and uplifting. I love the chorus. And you talked about all these different elements coming together. That's one of the things that really stands out about this record to me is it's this really um, serendipitous, everything falling into place in a way that I think there was friction clearly right so you've got trevor horn whose production style is all over this and you've also got trevor rabin basically becoming the the band leader in terms of the songwriting and also his his production sensibility as well um Mm -hmm. He's he 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 ends up becoming the the like the main source of the material and the musical director without being the front person. And then you've got like his voice sounds like meshes so well. Sometimes it's even hard to tell him and John Anderson apart. Yeah. But even on his new re- his new record, it's it's like wow, that sounds a lot like like these their voices are like cut from the same cloth almost, you know. So and then and again you've got the record the, the the record company and all these forces kind of pushing this album into being what it is and it couldn't have been anything else. I mean to hear Trevor Horn talk about his decisions, it's like wow, he had a huge yeah. stamp in how this that song and yes, it's Trevor Rabin's song, but mm-hmm. I'm, and, and the the original demo is out there. I've had the CD for for a couple decades now. And you hear, okay, these are all his songs, but man, the 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 sonic sheen and some of the choices yeah. that Trevor Horn made, it's it's just all like a lot of times having that many inputs, as you put it, can really kill a project. And in this case, I think it did the opposite. I think it elevated this to being something yeah. it just would never have been if you take one of those factors out. Oh, absolutely. Hearing some of the interviews with uh, Trevor Horn, I totally agree because you you hear him call out. Here's what I brought to the song, and yes, you can hear, you know, the original Raven demo. You can hear them re demo it once they've got in the in the studio with Horn, and you see each step that each of them brought to it, and you're like, oh, and now that's better. Uh, now this is now I like the song more, you know. And then Anderson comes in and he re- does the vocal, and oh, great, wow, now I like this even more. Um, you're right, that's rare. I think that's rare. Um. Leave it. I love. I love. I and hearts. It cut. You know, comes by by the end of the record. Hearts. I think is another banger for me. Um, yes, does it, and and this song. You know, they don't completely abandon their sound. I hear um, things in here in the drums and bass, um, especially in hearts. A little bit in maybe our song, but yes, compared to other prog bands, for example, they don't forget to groove sometimes. Mm. Um, like bass and drum. I mean, I, and that, that's probably com- coming from Chris Squire, bass is being a huge contributor to who they've been all along. Um, Close to the Edge has huge moments. Uh, uh, but well, on this record, Hearts, they have this yeah bass and drums groove where it's interesting to hear. I think the biggest change beyond just guitar sounds is drum approach is much more straightforward, but because these songs are much more straightforward, um, whereas before there could be tempo changes left and right um, and, you know, kind of excessive fills. This is a more toned in drumming approach, but Alan White still finds his moments to shine by, okay, so the tempo is not going to change, but what I'm going to do is flip the beat a little here for a measure or two, or me and Chris Squire on bass are going to lock in to a groove and something, you know, here's a real specific that I love that they carry on through other records. Uh, there's a there's a groove between the drum and bass where the kick is 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 linked up with the bass guitar, kick drum and bass guitar are grooving. There's a snare hit, 
And usually that snare hit would remove the kick drum. It would, it would be replacing the kick drum for a beat. Uh, but uh, Alan White keeps the kick and 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 snare cracking at the same time, right along with the bass drum. I don't know how to describe that without someone listening to it, but put on hearts and you will hear it. Um, he's grooving. He's keeping up. Uh, 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 it's just they have a, a, a bottom and a gut that a lot of other prog doesn't. I think prog is very much a mental thing most of the time or like teasing you with a lot of uh, sparkly little parts flight f- uh, flowing through the air. Yes doesn't forget to also like make you shake your ass once in a while uh, or stomp your feet or whatever, whatever it is that when your body moves to music, not just having like an intellectual high off of it. And I think that remains here, even though we've left behind a lot of the crazy proggy um, tempo changes and things that might have that even still exist at the time of Tormato or drama. Uh, you know, well, and what you were saying about uh, John Anderson's voice, I even, by the way, just to defend a little bit of drama, I didn't know that John Anderson wasn't on that record for a long time. Hmm. I had to go and look, oh, wait, that's Trevor uh, Horn there. Um, now I can hear it, knowing knowing both of their styles a little bit more. But um, yeah, yes, is a flexible is a flexible thing, I think. Yeah, you know, and they never, they always were a kick-ass rock band, even at their most... Mm-hmm sort of frilly or whatever, you know, sure. um, trim prog trimmings or excessive, you know, going back into the seventies, even into the sixties, they somehow always had this strong backbeat and this driving vibe. Even when you listen to the live stuff from this, from the 90125 period, it's quite driving. Alan White was a very driving, almost yes. aggressive drummer. You don't hear it as much on the record, but it's definitely in his approach naturally. And they had a, a lot of fire. And you're right. They had a lot of groove, even maybe not so much topographic oceans, but everything else, sure. there's there's a lot of, you kind of want to do this with your body almost like, yeah, like, yeah. like um, mm-hmm. you know, sort of push your, your not, not necessarily head bang, but like push your head like, Almost like the right. same you would do to hip hop, which is a, a strange thing to think about, but the same way you would be like, mm, 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 mm. yeah. So th- they never didn't have that. And you talked about bands that evolved. You you mentioned the police. The police evolved from record to record every time. I think what's interesting about Yes is they basically have like two gears, but. Mm. Really, where you get the first foreshadowing of them going pop is going for the one, is going for the one yeah. out of Relayer. Yeah. It's, you know, 18 minute opening. Is that 18 minutes or is it longer? There's an 18 minute opening track and then there's another suite on side two. Right. Um, which, you know, if you want to talk about the height of Prague ambition, that's to me much more so than Topographic Oceans. That's to me where they really capture this like everything you can do with an 18 minutes tune and make every note count. That's where they do it. And then they go into going for the one where they're doing shorter kind of songs is much more um, that, that to me is a, is a, is much more radical than Tormato or drama. Absolutely. I'm with you. I'm with you. That is a, uh, I'll I'll bring that up again in, uh, in defense of 90125. This is not the first time they had a big, kind of reapproach and you're right yeah that's the one going for the, the, the album artwork changes you know they abandon the usual roger dean fantasy landscapes i think they almost intentionally do that right it used to usually be like an animal or creature in a fantasy landscape now it's a human being a photograph and a cityscape right. and their sound and approach is definitely changed now you see them kind of shift gears again back into you know tornado drama um and this is a, uh, you know, it, it's not, doesn't sound the same as 90125, but like you just called out, they're going for more closer to song structure. And really as a songwriter and guitarist and stuff, like I'm inspired by, by yes, uh, Steve Howe as well, you know, uh, the guitar player of, of uh, most of the, the yes stuff, at least that early era. Um, but I'm a songwriter. I love a good hook and, and, and songwriting. So Prague in general is, 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 is eludes that kind of pop sensibility that I love, but 
Yes is one band that really makes the does meld those for me. You know, yeah, sure. Some of the songs are epic eight to 20 minute things but they still have singable moments. And I think in the mo at their, you know, if they ever failed in certain things, it is that like, I'll, I'll call out topograph topographic oceans, not that it's a uh, complete trash or anything, but it's like, I will, I will put it on and listen to it all the way through, give it the attention that it demands. And there's a few moments where, that I can return to in my memory and sing along. But after all these decades of listening to it, it doesn't really, hit me and, and hook me like that. Now that might be a little bit of uh, some craven pop sensibility, like where's the hook, where's the hook? And you can't find that in some, <laughs> in some, you know, classical jam piece, but I love when yes melds those moments. And I think this record has that I can just looking at the song titles of 90125, I could sing you with the choruses of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. So you're right. You're right to call that out as uh, another point where they really took a, took a swing in a different direction. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think it's just the, your pop sensibilities because I have never been able to get through Topographic Oceans, and I like a lot of stuff. Like to me, sure. on paper, Topographic Oceans sounds amazing. Yeah, uh, there's that one keyboard line, doo, 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 which I love at the very beginning. Yep, and then it just sort of mm -hmm. like dies off and starts to simmer versus gates of delirium the the epic opening track on on relayer relayer every moment keeps me on the edge of my seat on that on that like yeah. to me there's nothing excessive at all about that and you right. know if you if you know we have to bring in the other prog bands here so rush mm -hmm. genesis well let's, let's start with genesis in sort of seniority genesis king crimson jethro yeah. tull and rush were all at this same period starting to move in this same direction. I think with Yes, it was more of a radical shift. Well, actually, no, that's, I'm going to totally take that back. Um, I With similar to Genesis and Rush and Jethro Tull and King Crimson, actually all five of them, they're, they reach a point where you get to like a radical shift. So from between, yeah, between, um, hemispheres rush hemispheres and permanent waves it's a similar kind of thing like whoa like what happened here <laughs> like sure we've got our our most proggy album ever which again starts with a whole side of complete sweep mm -hmm. right and then all of a sudden we've got spirit of radio so it, 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 like all of these bands were were having to make these uh, drastic decisions to kind of find their footing. And I also think they were just doing it just to stay creatively fulfilled too. I think in Russia's case, Absolutely. they were very excited by the new sounds. They were influenced right. by the police, you know, j just like, uh, just like Trevor Horn was with the snare sound on, on owner of a lonely heart rush were openly right. influenced by the police a couple times on moving pictures. And then the whole album, all of signals, is yes very much police influenced um, you're right they suddenly are, are there canadian dudes that suddenly have like a little reggae jumped in there <laughs> it was not funny a little. to have that in the police <laughs> not a little yeah. you know when it's and, yeah. and you were talking about how a lot of these bands it's not prog isn't thought of as something that get comes from the hips or even from the heart a lot of the time right it doesn't it doesn't mm. come from like sweat it, it isn't thought of that way although I think Yes can do it. I think Jethro Tull definitely did it. I think Genesis in their prime also had some of that too. But Rush, I would say for me, as much of a Rush fan as I, I'm like, like a huge Rush fan, I always thought they sounded stiff a little bit. And in some cases, a lot. Except for Signals. I don't understand to me, that's my favorite Rush album, mm. and I don't understand cool. how they were able to make those reggae grooves work. I have this fantasy image of yeah. like Alex Lifeson putting, putting pot in brownies and being like, Oh, Hey Neil, uh, I brought this dessert in and didn't <laughs> tell him it was weed. And somehow it, yeah. because he grooves on that record, unlike anything else he's ever done. And that's it's, what I like about that record. Yeah. It's like smooth and graceful and, and, um, 
I described it. I I wrote that record up for for the deluxe edition, and I said it's almost like he's like cool. he's like um, he's like a ballet dancer on the on the on the kit on that record. And why is that not anywhere else? So I like to think it's because mm-hmm. Alex Lifeson sneaks some weed into his. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy it. I'll buy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. That is one of my, you know, that's probably what I don't love a ton of Prague. I love Yes. I, I love Mars Volta, but even so, Mars Volta, a more modern Prague band, uh, Neo Prague, maybe. I also fall off with them. Like I, their early records, their first record has songs, but they're still, you know, when, I, when I'm calling it songs, I mean, like, it's like there's a chorus, there's a hook. Mm-hmm. And the style of it, yes, they're using um, styling and instrumentation that is calling, recalling prog sounds and tones, but they still have something in there you can hold on to. Sure. Um, and those first two releases of theirs, to me, are their strongest because they do continue to go do more um, insane stuff, excessive stuff that is fun live and on drugs, but it's not something I put on in the car and like, you know, I don't know, uh, jam out to necessarily. But yeah, I mean, um, compared to those other bands, they all made transitions. Just like you said, Genesis, I think of Genesis as an 80s band. Mm -hmm. And then I have to remember like, oh, the bulk of their stuff is because they have a huge, huge success going into the 80s and Rush as well. Um, And it's almost like it's not just prog bands that have this in common. Those bands that we're talking about now, these are bands that spanned decades. Mm-hmm. And it's just like musical styles change. And it's not like you have to, you know, circling back now, but not that you have to keep up with the changing styles, but y- new technology comes along, new ways of recording comes along. You know, band members come and go over that amount of time and you get bored. <laughs> you just want to try new things as a creative. So of course, there's going to be these moments of what do we do now? Some people really pull it off outside of Prague. We, I mean, last time you and I talked, you mentioned Kid A. That was a huge departure sure. for a band. In the, the opposite direction. Game. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. They pull yeah. it off. They pull it off, but not without, uh, you know, criticism and and outrage at the moment. Or just shock, Um, right? Or just like, or people crying, you know, I don't mean to diminish, (laughs) but, you know, someone's really, really attached to the Benz. Yes. That soundtrack, their 14 to 22 year old period in their life somewhere, you know, if they were any of those ages and it's like one of those real attached to your life kind of records and then they go and do, you know, two albums later, they're doing (laughs) something where the band this sounds like it's been vaporized right it's been like, like yeah. sucked into like yeah. a a digital um vaporizer or like a, a, a gr- ground up into like digital bits and bytes you're like i can <laughs> see where where someone would be like what the fuck is this or with wilco yeah. similar thing sure in in that case yeah i mean this begs the question how much do we give our favorite bands room to develop because when i was a kid when i was a teenager i didn't think about this stuff as much now i've gotten more something in my brain sort of gets in the way and gets more solidified oh this is not the real whatever and and it it, it kind of get tripped up on that whereas when i was a kid i could just i could just inhale it all and not really stop it there would be no obstruction yeah and I, mm. I wish I had that back a little bit where I could just relax a little more. And part of the reason why I was trying to gauge, you know, I think with Yes, It Is a very sharp turn. I mean, they broke up a couple of years before. And, yeah. then, and again, this wasn't supposed to be a Yes album. This was a completely different direction. So when they came back, there was also that sort of fanfare, that sort of um, there was hype, you know, with that. The, the one that I would point to that is probably less drastic than I always thought or, le- or less instantaneous is Genesis. If you look at the middle period, there's like a four album run where mm-hmm. Peter Gabriel has left. Two of those records, Steve Hackett is still on those records. And that middle period to me is a gradual shift from the one to the other because I had always thought of them as like, wow, this sounds so different. Like it's... Mm much more much more drastic like if you go from like abacab to selling england by the pound you can't even hear anything that right. even resembles 
I mean, you can hear the voices and maybe some of Tony Banks's start, like uh, some of his like favored melodies or something, but Mm -hmm. that's not the case here where, where there are still elements, as you were saying, that are still intact. You still very much feel like you're listening to something that grew out of the same tree. Sure. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that maybe it's about, you know, for Prague being such a, a kind of a broad label. Now you can, you know, there's like things that fit into Prague as the classic box that you think of what it is. And it's capes and fairies. And Rick Wakeman, uh, basically. Whatever. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Um, or or visuals you, you imagine from Spinal Tap, uh, from This Is Spinal Tap, or things like that. But Maybe, you know, the thing that really fits where, hey, this band can change sounds over time, like Genesis, like, yes, is here's what I think is uh, in the late 70s, things in rock music go in two directions. One, musicians that love musicianship. And maybe this is kind of what we're talking about. It's more of a heady thing. Maybe they come from a classical background. They have training and they want to infuse themselves into rock. So classical uh, training and musicianship and rock and roll music. I can see where that takes like, yes, Prague, Genesis, bands like that. Meanwhile, there's on the other side of the railroad tracks, there's uh, punk rockers that they're like, uh, we don't know how to play our instruments necessarily. We don't care. We think that's lame to even learn what these chords mean. All I know is I pick up this guitar, I put on this jacket and I'm fucking cool. And I'm going to work with that, the body, uh, the rock and roll part of it. That's just like in your bones, in your body. And, um, and, you know, so that's what I really think about. That's what drew me to certain prog uh, bands was I was a I came from having piano lessons when I was a kid to playing in concert band and then picked up the guitar. And uh, I get disappointed in a lot of pop music. That's three chords. I'm like, oh, I get why this works. I get why it catches on. I, I'm also bored creatively. Um, and it's fun to find that balance for myself is constantly try and find like, OK, what what's what is just serving some part of me that wants to come off super high end and intellectual versus what, uh, you know, uh, kind of connects with people in a, in a simpler way. Um, so yeah, I see Genesis. I, I will just to bring it back to 90125. I see musicianship on this record. We talked last time I, I spoke with you, we, we, we talked a lot about sports, uh, the Huey Lewis record. Uh, and that's another record that has very eighties production style in that there's a lot of sequenced drum and bass guitar parts, meaning like they're the natural instruments are replaced by essentially keyboard synthesizers playing those things in a much more mechanical straight ahead way. Um, but this record for, even though it fits into that sound and that style, you can hear a real deal. Chris Squire playing all the bass parts all the way through in his style with his tone, with his fingering that is, uh, you know, I think essential to keeping it sounding human, even though we're in the era of this album is like, hey, we're all being synthesized into the Borg and we're leaning into that. But we're keeping things about us that are human. And I hear that in the bass guitar. That would have been re, re replayed on keys if it was any other group. But these guys are great players. So even if it's a simpler strong song structure than uh, the Gates of Delirium, for example, it's still important that they're bringing their musicianship and the weird little fills that they do that throw you for a looper in there. And even owner of a lonely heart, the, uh, what Trevor Horn would call bits and bobs, the sort of sound effect tricks that it's pulling. They're innovative. They're not lazy. Are they eighties? Yes. They're eighties as hell, but they're all, they're like, they're not just sitting there being like, we're fitting in with this pastiche. They're pushing some kind of boundary. They're, they retain some kind of pioneership. They're very musical. Those little bim, 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 it's very, you know, you yeah. can see an orchestra director having fun with that. Like, how are we going to transpose that to oh, like, yeah. the whole string section going, doo, 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 you know? Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's a, there's a yin yang in there. And you talked about a balance and interestingly, there sure. is a Mars Volta interview with mm. Omar and Cedric. Mm -hmm. It, this has to be probably 20 years old at this point. And they're talking about, it is Cedric who says, we didn't, and I'm paraphrasing, but we didn't grow up with this split. For us, we could like Black Flag and Vandergraaf mm -hmm. Generator. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was Black Flag that he mentioned, but, I, but it was definitely Vandergraaf Generator. I remember him saying that. In other words, 
what you're talking about where you have where you have this divide in music Mm -hmm. you don't like by the time i was listening to music as a kid that was pretty much there were other divides but i didn't have to choose between like kiss and yes you know what i mean i could Uh i could do do both you know um and uh, somebody that i know a friend of mine once put it beautifully she's a, a film reviewer and also a food writer and she said well i look at music as like it's like you have the choice you can go rustic for your meal or you can go to high-end fine dining and they're both interesting satisfying and i thought that's just like the perfect way to frame this Mm -hmm. it's more it's not so much a dichotomy as it is a continuum because what's satisfying about punk or or very raw forms of music is watching bands become uh, more musical as they go along, right? So, like, eventually, mm. like the Clash, they right. get to a place where there's there's a lot of musicality there. There's a lot of development there in what they're doing. Even the Ramones, actually, I would say, there's something. Mm. It's a quality of that. They're not just like hammering away mm-hmm. uh, haphazardly. Uh, mm-hmm. And I would certainly say that Sex Pistols record has a ton. Even Steve Jones has said, we weren't just going in there to bang it out. It wasn't like that. Yeah. Right. So hearing that sort of like hearing in raw music where it starts to point towards increased development. And then on the other side, hearing in really, really highly charted, developed, trained, formal music where it starts to point towards emotion uh, and simplicity, I think can be very rewarding. There's a ton of middle ground. In yes. It. You like listen to like Joe Absolutely. Jackson or Elvis Costello or something. They're right in that zone, right? Where it's like, especially Elvis Costello, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's like he's considered a punk figure, but is so... There's so much like formality and and songwriting sense and eventually flat out composition and rawness and emotion all jumbled together. Sure, absolutely. A lot and, of that shows up in British artists. I mean, we're, you're mentioning a lot of British artists right now, you know, and I feel like it's you see so much of that. I grew up in uh, stuffy environment, but I idolized American artists that were cowboys to me. And the marriage of those two things, you know, really turned out something special for decades and decades. I mean, you don't get the Rolling Stones without that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit different, you know, but it's like they are upper crust Uh (laughs) kids, Uh like in love with American blues, which is they weren't the only ones, obviously. And you know what, uh, what I've never really thought of in this light is the who are the op are kind of so super raw incredibly Mm kick-ass like like volcanically powerful rock band right then they start to go highbrow with tommy and and quadrophenia and quadrophenia yeah and even those those like sort of uh keyboard those like those um those sort of automated keyboard patterns on on who's next right it's like there's this Sure. It's, it's what I'm talking. And then you look at Pete Townsend's stuff on his own. It's it's almost operatic, right? Like like the way yeah, he's reaching. Very cerebral, mm-hmm. right? So it's like you don't you don't have to scratch your itch, itch in just one way. I guess mm-hmm. it's, it's mm-hmm. more that there's more than one. Uh, there's more than one ways to get to get to 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 where you want to go. Absolutely. Yeah, fusion is at the essence of like creativity, like taking one thing and another thing and saying, where do these meet? It's very much like, you know, I, I in, in my day job life, I work with, uh, I work in organic plant care and uh, very much into, you know, uh, preserving our environment and studying and these things. So at, at the places where water and land meet, these are called estuaries. And that's where the highest percentage of like life is like, you find the most diversity in species and that's why they're also the most protected lands where need to be is, you know, this, this one environment is over here, this other environment's over here and where they cross over, there is a, that is where the essence of like life is. And I think that absolutely applies uh, musically, creatively, 
um, is, you know, integrating the opposite. It's what we're always, always, you know, even working on as human beings. What, what am I lacking and how can I work towards that? That's growth, right? So um, I love the ecl eclectic nature of yes and everyone we're bringing up here. I mean, yeah, the police keeps coming to mind for me here, you know, bringing together their own backgrounds, but uh, working in the style of punk rock, working in the style of new wave later, um, it brings something all its own. And that's just the game of any creative outlet of any creative work that you're doing is like, okay, I'm inspired by something. So I'm carrying that with me, uh, stealing from it in some way, but I also have my own voice and I have something I want to say. And where do these things two meet? Uh, where do these two things meet? And it's, uh, you know, it's a constant game, uh, that's why I think it, you know, these divides that we talk about sometimes where it's like, what are you into kiss or, or, uh, I forget who you mentioned now. Uh, are you into disco or punk rock or whatever? It's like, uh, we can do it all, man. Why do I have to choose? I don't love it when we get too, uh, caught up in one or the other. Like, if you like this band, you can't like that. Like, come on. I remember to me, it feels a little opposite. When I was younger, I felt like there was more um fighting about that kind of thing but that was very also very 90s it was about calling everyone a sellout <laughs> uh, either you're you know either you're nirvana or even nirvana got called sellouts right mm -hmm. you know either you're from seattle and you're grunge and you live on the streets uh or, or bust you know I, I mentioned to you before i i remember really coming I remember 1994 being a musical formative year where i was playing a lot of uh, Donkey Kong Country with my buddies and listening to Green Day Dookie and Ace of Base The Sign. That didn't bother me at all. <laughs> but probably outside of that room, I might have got made fun of for one or the other of those. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really, uh, I loved the, the freedom to look back at all this stuff, uh, you know, a long time ago. That's now long beyond all those divides. And I just get to mix it all together in a stew and, and uh, let it rock. So I love listening to all these yes records. And that's how, by the way, that's how I did dig into yes. Once I decided to, I uh, fell in love. I listened to close to the edge on at uh, probably like a listening station and music shop. Mm, and the then I thing? bought um, probably the side one. And I was like, Oh, I need to get into these guys, but I was broke at the time. So I didn't buy the CD. I did go to it. I was in college in uh, the Midwest and broke. So I went to a, an antique shop. They had, I don't know if, if anyone's ever seen, or if this is still available anywhere. It was a tape collection. It looked like it's the size. It was probably a 12 inches, you know, the size of a vinyl. Uh, but it, you opened it up and it was a book of maybe eight cassettes. And it was, it was called yes stories, I think. Hmm. And it's like, selections from all the albums kind of just put together. It's almost like one big greatest hits. And that's what I had in my car, the tape player at the time. So I wasn't listening through albums. I was listening through what, whoever made these choices, what songs, and this included nine, included right up through uh big union, I believe. Big and generator and union. You mean big jet, big generator. I think it gets as far as big generator, maybe to union. Um, so I was hearing these kind of all mixed together. Um, all the different, you know, eras and genres of yes. And I loved it. Um, that's, that's probably what introduced me to, I think leave it as a owner of a lonely heart and leave it is on there. Um, but yeah, leave it is my, my, my fave on this record, leave it and hearts. Um, I really like the, the, the B side of this album. Yeah. Hmm. Our song, our song, leave it and hearts really stand out to me on this one. But anyways, yes. Uh, that whole, mix mash stew that you kind of get to ch choose any flavor that I, I do love that about about this band and uh about bands in general you know, different uh albums in different eras yeah and i mean to some degree when you're younger you do have to there's just this like natural adolescent push to to define yourself according to what you're into and then draw a line between you and everybody else who's into other stuff there's this like inherent mm -hmm. sort of tribalistic vibe to to music i mean i i was very open i'd like to say as a young listener but i mean i there were certain things i in my own snootiness uh synth pop whatever like nah, it's not my thing I, you know mm -hmm. i need stuff that's like mm -hmm. heavier kind of a thing but certainly by my 20s was all that was completely breaking down and i find that over time, what initially is a 
seemingly impassable rift like rock and disco. Now sure. you can't find an, an indie band that even for the last 20 years almost that doesn't incorporate some kind of disco in it. I mean, there's a, like, like it, they're, they're completely blended together that social division and the underlying sort of racial division yeah. is, is totally forgotten about. Um, sure. Even like between hip hop and mainstream music. I mean, like I right. remember when having a hip hop song on mainstream radio, like run DMC and Aerosmith was a huge, humongous deal was like the first thing to, to, to do that where it was like considered, very off limits right yeah um and i think that's healthy for those things to to disappear and i i i wish people didn't retain that into adulthood <laughs> you know what i mean sure. I, I just wish and i it's like you're talking about something like prog rock there's all these sort of stereotypes that come with it that to me have nothing to do with the music and there's still, I find that in the way in the way people, even as adults, talk about music, not so much musicians, but people need to sort of file their identity within certain boxes in music and all the other aesthetics that come with that. Oh, I was a prog rock kid. I was a skater kid. I was a mm. hip hop kid. I was a hardcore, you know, whatever. And I find that the average person, if you just leave it up to their ears, will make a stew out of all these different styles. Sure. They'll just draw from whatever, but it's like the social, their sense of the social pressure that keeps them on mm -hmm. one track. This reminds me. So I never saw yes. Live. I only saw yes live twice. And it was on the same, it was at the same time. And it was that union show with the, uh, with the with wow. The and I got to yeah. say, it was, it was mind blowing. It was incredible. <laughs> And I thought that it might be just, oh, it was 1991. Maybe my ears weren't mature enough. And maybe if I listened to some of that now, I wouldn't be as impressed. And I saw some footage of it. And it's, it was just like the feeling I remember. It was really powerful. Uh, and I didn't know much of their stuff. But just as a case in point, so I saw that show in Buffalo. And then I saw... I went to Madison Square Garden. I must have been home for the weekend or something. And I haven't looked up the dates, but so I saw the show at Madison Square Garden and then I took a cab and went across town to the Ritz and saw De La Soul mm -hmm. and Leaders of the New School later that night. And at the time, that didn't feel like to me, like I was even, <laughs> it didn't feel very jarring to me at all. I think it would sort of now just, just, you know, it's like going from like a Japanese uh -huh. restaurant to like a, yeah. <laughs> an Indian restaurant or something. Um, sure. But that just goes to show. And they were both awesome shows. And I'm very happy that I did both on the same night. Hell yeah. <laughs> I want, I need to look up footage of that era. Cause I'm so, you know, I've been, I spent this week just digging on 90125 and I'm like, I, I, I would love to see what comes after where, the classic dudes uh, come back and they're like, you know, making a new thing with, uh, with the new yes um, to the reunion tour. I would love to find footage of that. That's awesome. I didn't see yes until, you know, they came to long. I lived in long Island most of my life and they came to long Island in 2011. Uh, so it was still, I mean, Chris Squire was still around and Chris Squire. Um, was John Anderson gone by that point? He was right. Yeah, it was, uh, what's his name? Ben Benoit David, I think was his name, mm -hmm. who I think the singer that took over, who I think was doing, um, he might have been one of the guys that they pulled from like a, a tribute act. Um, but Steve Howe was there, Chris Squire was there, Alan White on drums, and they had uh, the old uh, Buggles and Drama era, yes, uh, Jeff Downs on keys. Um, and they were actually, it was them, I think they're opening for foreigner hmm. but I, funny enough i had a gig so i had i i watched them and then i boogied down out east to go play and i missed uh you know i was there for yes but uh um yeah you know i i want to go back and check out some of those uh the un the union era and just see just see what it's like the instrumentation of those classic songs with all those uh, musicians together on stage it was um, really intense I just, I mean, just it was very 
um, there was an intensity to the whole show to both times and in the footage I've seen that yeah. you might not expect from something that sort of grandiose. Sure. Sure. I would. Yeah. I want I really want to check that. I, and it's so unique Trevor Rabin in the midst of those fellows. Cause he was such a, a much younger up and coming kind of guy. This is other, these other guys were worried about, you know, becoming irrelevant dinosaurs by now. And here's this guy with all this new uh, energy and man, it's so, I think it is both um, speaks to his confidence and also their, uh, the rest of the band's uh, willingness to. So, I mean, like you said it well before he is at the heart of the songwriting throughout this whole album and so, sort of the creative vision and what a risk and what a, you know, what balls to take it uh, and good for them. Um, yeah. I, I really want to catch some of those. Uh, th this is juicing me up to go, to go look at some Trevor Rabin on stage with, uh, Steve Howe and see how that goes. Yeah. I mean, I didn't get to, that, that was one thing I didn't get to ask him about. Unfortunately, I mm -hmm. really wanted to ask him about, cause there was, there were reports of friction between him and Steve Howe that I've never gotten mm -hmm. too much info on, but it was not the mm -hmm. easiest. I mean, he spoke openly about it not being the most pleasant experience for him, but in mm -hmm. terms of the musical reward of being in the audience man it was it was incredible and then he became friends with rick wakeman during that time uh i find it interesting that since the steve howe led um configuration of yes re-coalesced after trevor rabin left in the mid 90s yeah. They still play on over Lonely Heart. So Steve Howe has had to like inherit that tune, just like Trevor Rabin had to inherit his all of his mm -hmm. sort of legacy as well, which I which I find kind of you know it's a sort of a neat twist of fate. Um I'm a big fan of the whole Trevor Rabin era, actually. I love Big Generator and cool. I really, really like talk. I like that whole thing that they that the, the 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 sort of like uh the character of that sound for those three records i thought it still holds up for me and actually his his new solo album has so much of that it's it's expanded and there's it's like updated but for me i just felt like there was the first single from that record is called big mistakes and it's just yeah. like this breath of fresh of like familiar it's like fresh air, but it's so familiar. It's like, oh, wow. Like, like I remember when that sound was all over the radio and it's not a rehash at all, yeah. but it uh -huh. it's, it's a warm, like my system really welcomed that feeling. I was like, oh, it's, it's nice to have this back in the, mm -hmm. the, uh, I don't know, in the ozone again. Sure. Yeah. I listened to that single just before we got on here. Um, and I had a, a similar feeling. I got. I mean, for me, I'm a, I'm I'm mostly a guitar player these days, so I'm happy when guitar shows up again. It, it, it disappears in production styles for whole decades at a time, and I'm happy uh, when it shows up and and gives me that warm feeling again. And I did get it. I only listened to that one song. I'll have to check out more of his uh, his whole new record, but I, I I recognize that there. It was a change for me, I'll say, because I was a very big Steve Howe. Uh, uh, devotee, devotee, as far as his playing style and approach, and yes, if you take Steve Howe's introduction from Yes compared to Trevor Rab uh, Rabin's introduction, there are drastically different guitar styles. But just like you brought up, by the time we're doing Tormato and Drama, Steve Howe is—he's moved closer to what the '80s guitar sound would be. It's a little more rock and a little more um saturated in distortion there are seconds uh, of that of those two records that suddenly sound a little bit like um some of what king crimson was doing uh, i always find yes and king crimson very different even though they're in the same uh you know they get lumped together a lot but it brings in some of that heavy metal almost influence before raven shows up um so yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to checking out some more rabbit area. I, I I really end with yes at nine oh one two five. So this is gonna spur me to go check out you know Union Big Generator. I, I I always hear things about those records and I have never fully explored. So I'm excited to and Trevor's new stuff. It yeah. also had me go listen to the whole Buggles record. I had never listened to that record. I haven't I either. Knew the song. It's it's cool. I mean it's cool. It's new wave and it's um 
minimalist. It's in the style, you know, something, if you like sparks, it's got some of those vibes. And um, I, I love that whole era of music where it's like the dorky nerd wave kind of shit, like Devo and stuff. So. Yeah. Well, you know, and you go, we, let's not forget Steve Howe's style in Asia is pop mm. is not yep, Prague absolutely. at all. So, yep. so he sort of did something in the same ballpark you know absolutely yeah uh i i have to get i have to get into the buggles i love like i said i love trevor horn's production that first seal record is is one of my favorite records ever and uh, the production on that is just just like knocks me out similar to actually maybe even a little bit more so than the production on 90125 but it's such a strong flavor and Mm-hmm. I I'm create I'm bana- like they reissued that record a deluxe version last right before the holidays last year and I listened to it again I'm like man this record is is just as incredible now as it was 30 years ago um I I I I love his like he is on par to me with like Daniel Lenoir as having his own language of production Mm. and i need to get back i need to get into some of his his you know his other catalog i need to check out that malcolm mclaren record i just looked up his his production discography right before we were talking um there's a bunch of stuff on there that i need to i want to sit down and and totally the buggles and i don't know the story of why they picked him but it seems like an unorthodox like kind of an odd choice you know what i mean like out of their they went sort of off the reservation to grab somebody from a different. Um, I know, different I know, and I, I they have they have a few moments of that throughout their career, and I don't know this about this choice, but in other uh, similar choices, it's often the thing that links them is the label or management steps in and says, "Hey, why don't you meet with this guy who I have a contract with as well?" It speaks of an era where A and R, true artist repertoire, like management was important to labels where uh, you know uh they were like oh we have bands that we want to invest in artistically and so we're going to link up people that we think might work together well of course it's within our own company so that means all the money comes to us but that is something that i think has absolutely disappeared (laughs) for a long time uh is a label stepping in and being like hey you're looking for a guitar player? I know one over here that uh, would, or you're looking for a producer? I know one over here that might fit you guys, or let's take a, you know, experiment and 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 take a swing with a new guy. That's my guess. I don't know. <laughs> I'll have to look. Was Buggles on Atlantic at the time? I don't know. Yeah, we'll have to check that Maybe out. Atlantic was done. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it's been talked about a ton, why, how that all, t- 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 like why it turned out that way it, it's funny when that interview with trevor horn one of the ones i sent you he's like my wife told yeah. me don't do it trevor don't do it yeah but, you, know, <laughs> that, you know she thought they were totally passe why are you joining a prog band right. <laughs> yeah now alan white is also a similar case of someone who you wouldn't have expected is kind of a almost completely different style from bill bruford and sure right before he joined yes there's a really good documentary video on like a vhs i i I might even have it um but i don't even have a vhs player anymore but uh Mm -hmm. we we could find it online where he had played with john lennon right before that he was flown on plane his first gig with john lennon was at an outdoor festival john and yoko and was learning the songs on the plane wow and then the call came that's crazy for yes (laughs) <laughs> and the first thing and even does, that call if i what is that well the first thing he does is topographic oceans but you were saying oh, crazy yeah it sounded like that they that he had he was thrown into that very quickly you said he was learning songs on the plane he jumped into yes with i think they had uh what was it some gigantic show that they played in a stadium and he's like hey you got a few days to learn the, all the yes songs right until now through topographic that's craziness yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, I was that stresses I, me out just thinking about it. Oh, sure. <laughs> God. I mean, but these guys, that was their thing. Uh, uh yeah. I saw a video sort of in a similar vein of Simon Phillips the other night being shown. It was on Drumeo, and he was being shown mm. highlight moments from his career, mostly live stuff. 
And there's a video of him playing with Billy Cobham and Art Blakey. So he was on the bill at Montreux Jazz Festival mm-hmm. and Claude Nobbs, the 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 organizer, goes, oh, yeah, yeah, like, um, come by the, the, on a different night when than he was supposed to be playing. Oh, yeah, stop by, like, here. And it's like, oh, no, 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 we want you to play a show, like, the three of you drummers. And he's like, wait, what? <laughs> like, 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 and just... Psh- they threw him into the pool and he did it, which I mean, you got to think is so nerve wracking, right? Imagine (laughs) two of your, like one of your heroes and one of the like godfathers, I don't know, name Mm -hmm. two people that would, and then, Oh yeah, yeah, Jimmy. uh, Yeah. I I, I was just going to have you jam with them, but actually we're going to do a whole show of that and you're going to improvise. That's nuts (laughs) to think about. Yeah, no, that makes me nervous. <laughs> but these guys also had so much practice. You know, I bet you right. at that point, Alan White had like logged more gig miles than you or I will can even dream sure. of, right? It's like a different era yeah. of musicians. It's like athletes played almost every game back in like, right. you know, the 90s NBA, you'd play 82 games and all the playoffs and you barely would miss a game. Now it's totally different, right? It's like a similar thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, I mean, the pace has changed even in the last few years. I, I came across, I was just reorganizing my office here for better creative flow. I'm trying to get some writing done. But, um, and I came across a schedule of mine from right before the pandemic, uh, the lockdown, all this. And I had like two, within two weeks, I played like six gigs with five bands. Now it's like a few gigs in a year. (laughs) I'm happy for that. I can't imagine going back to that pace, but you're right. I mean, things have changed. Those guys were flying all around the world, just gigging with everybody and anybody. Uh, And God bless them for it. They're they're legends for a reason. (laughs) Yeah. And they were comfortable trying to be adaptable. You know, I'm sure that was hugely nerve wracking. Like, like, uh, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have blamed the guy if he's like, nah, I need another couple minutes to I need a day to prepare or something. But it's like, well, when are you going to get a chance like that again? Yeah. You know, you're yeah. not going to, so you might as well just, just try. And then he talked about another gig where he had to play the Prince's trust with Jimmy page and, and not feeling like he was prepared enough. He tried to, but it, there just wasn't enough time to, to do it. So, I mean, that, that happens too. And, you know, Crazy. we talked about Andy Summers before, or you mentioned yeah. the, the guy like slept with his guitar from like age 12 or something and was like constantly playing. And then when he got to gigging age, was constantly playing. He was like older than those other two dudes. Yeah. And yep. by the time they, their career took off, like when the band, when he joined the band, he was older. And again, you have this sort of quasi punk presentation but this sure. guy has been like playing every permutation of a scale that you can imagine. Mm-hmm. And, and like, you know, almost when you read his book, one train later, it's like, he was in that same era as the Beatles that were playing like, you know, 11 shows a night or some crazy thing where you probably need to do speed or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Amphetamines <laughs> to like, keep up with it. <laughs> um, So yeah, it's like, the bands we grew up hearing from the seventies into the eighties, there was so much craft that had gone into yeah. what, what we heard. There was so much of a pre story to that, you know, even with yes, they were kind of like a folk, a folk band or like sort of like in the vein of Oaky like the birds or yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Like yeah. Like the rock. Strobs. Yes. Mm-hmm. Their first three records are more like that than than they are. Eventually, the prog starts to come in, but like, yeah. So, I th- I like to think that kids doing TikTok today, when you watch these kids that just have like astounding chops, I like sure. to think that's sort of the the modern equivalent of what we're talking about. But it doesn't rebirth. Yeah, but it doesn't like replace the playing with musicians other musicians and Mm -hmm. really just just sitting in a stew with like the your bandmates and gelling you know what i mean 
the like I wish that would come back for some reason. I I don't know how we're gonna do that, but I wish it would. Hey, I'm with you, and this is this is a call to all modern musicians. I would say we've been talking a lot about how the '80s changed um, rock and roll, for example. Rock and roll being a very real, visceral, in the room with each other thing, and then the '80s hits and the studio and production styles begin to get a lot more automated, synthesized, th- synthetic. I would say for the first half of the decade, 90125 included. Um, you get the benefit of the, that little musical estuary. These things are crossing over and real talented dudes are coming in to new technology. I think by the time we're leaving the 80s, we're maybe relying a little too much on technology. And and and, and now um, with the prolif- proliferation of everyone's got a computer, well, now also everyone has a home studio because you can get a DAW and a few things and now you're good to go and you have a band in a box. And this is a, a big, great lowering uh the bar for people to get in and write songs but now what we're missing is that in-person collaboration that i think is essential to or maybe hey this is a cheat code do you want to get ahead of all the other producers and songwriters that are just sitting at home by themselves with a keyboard um get in a room with somebody and and find what's different between you and them and what you both bring to the table and figure out where that fits together. Cause that's where so much special, special stuff comes from. Uh, not that there's more, there isn't more to explore in the world of automation and AI and all that, but boy, I'm, I'm sure um, more interested in the things that uh, make us human coming through in songs than the things that are uh, offloaded to a program. <laughs> well, and you are now playing in, a group gamblers that mm-hmm. is the epitome of the those two worlds fusing into one thing. Absolutely, and uh, gamblers did a very intentional thing with our new record, where we knew there there would be parts of it that are very electronic. Um, uh, however, we started by sitting in a garage for for dudes sitting in a garage writing with just like, hey, what about this? What about that? Not through, uh, not even through settings that we we're actually sitting there and working through the songs together. So the heart of that whole album was very much what I was familiar with in uh, growing up doing rock. And then part B is get into the studio. And now we're kind of reopening all these songs and, and bringing a new eye to it, which is uh, what are we going to do with these new sounds, new production styles? And so, uh, yeah, you can, you can absolutely meld all of this stuff uh, to your benefit. Um, and that's that's our goal with uh, Gambler's new record, Pulverizer. Look for it in 2024. <laughs> well, and I think that people maybe overestimate what technology brings to the equation because it does have a, I guess you could say a dehumanizing effect at first. But I think what happens is you eventually begin to see people craving a human factor, even when they don't know that they're mm-hmm. doing that. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the, you can you can point to points along the way and say, oh, because of this, because of this, because of this, we lost this, we lost this, we lost this, it's never coming back. I don't ever think it's never coming back. I mm-hmm. think that somehow that desire to be blood, sweat, and tears in a room with someone is always going to be crucial to who we are and to the making of music and people will always swing the pendulum all the way out and then back towards the middle and then all the way out and or or all the way out in another direction and then back towards the middle and i mean again just the fact that gamblers and and the band leader and gamblers mike mcmanus who introduced us to each other um has values both of those things equally is an in the box producer and also yeah did all this playing in like punk bands and all these different kinds of bands and get sees the vision of gamblers as having one foot in each world to me i think that's beautiful and you know you guys are by no means the the only example of that but are a seamless epitome of the fact that we can we can have the best of both Hell yeah. Thank you. I love that. I, uh, that's very intentional and I'm glad it's coming across and I'm happy to hear that, that it's reflected in the, uh, final product. I know you've got to listen to some of that. Um, yeah, I love that. 
I mean, hey, you're right. Trends uh, change, and and I feel like it often goes. Let's take something that's new, go to the excess with it, and then crave the opposite again. And you know, you can see that over and over in the history of rock. You can see that through rap, uh, where it gets really about glitz and glam, and then it gets about being hard and street. You know, and it, and it kind of bounces between those things all the time. Yeah, um, and, cool. And yeah, and you know, with time, it does take the edge off of. I mean, I guess. You, you can't listen to 90125 and not think of the 80s, right? You can't not think of the period it's from. And yet at the same time, there's an essence of that record that just lives on. There's a reason why Owner of a Lonely Heart, and I would think to some degree either Changes or Leave It are also big on the radio, maybe not, definitely not as much. But yeah. Owner of a Lonely Heart is probably on every karaoke list in the world. Oh, yeah. I would think. Right. Or at least that has access to Western pop music. Sure. Uh, there's a reason why, and it doesn't... It, you, yes, you feel the 80s, especially having lived through that period. I definitely feel that, but it's also... There's a soul there that some of the bubblegum... That the bubblegum pop from the 80s doesn't have. Mm-hmm. And I guess that's sort of the, the trick, right? Like how to convey our humanness through these tools. I mean, we got to remember recording itself was probably seen by people in the day who were like, no, 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 no. You play a concert in person, but yes. putting it on some sort of acetate or whatever. <laughs> that's uh-huh. not, that's not music. That's going to destroy music. I bet you there were people thinking, no, 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 oh, no, yeah. no. That's going to destroy music. I, I chart it out and people play it or, or we're going to sit with a banjo and a guitar and this is music, right? Something to think about. Oh yeah. I mean, you see that from the Beatles beginnings to the end of their career, they somewhere in there. So new technology comes along uh studio being abandoned in the studio is like then what they suddenly devote themselves to, but they don't go to the craven like, oh, okay, great. Let's just make it all about this new technology. They're like, what is the artistic way to integrate this? And they really uh, are incredibly inventive. And, and and now we're all still chasing that. Like, oh, okay, the studio is an instrument that humans can use. Um, so, yeah, I, I love that. Keeping technology as a tool that you use, um, not as the answer to, to replacing human beings in all these settings. Uh, it's, you can still find uh, endless art in there um uh, so thank you yeah i mean i think of i think <laughs> yes and and other people too i mean i think of donna summer and giorgio moroder right that that like really mm. autobahn craft worky sounding I forget, sure. I forget the name of the song Absolutely. but it's like a super famous song by her that sounds really fresh and exciting and even africa bombada said he thought craft work were funky which is amazing to think about when i mean it's like yeah you would never no i mean look bands from that era did uh they're not the only you know gang of four bands that did more of the you can trace some of that uh crossover for sure um i and and you mentioned before that some of that tribal uh division is often among fans rather than the actual musicians gang of four loved uh, funk rock you know funk and shit like that and and getting people to dance and things like that uh, even though you think of it as like white guys with guitars that are angular it's like no oh, hey man they, their influences were very eclectic yeah and in england right when you like when the post-punk scene starts in england which is hard to say exactly where punk goes into post-punk but there was yeah. very much a, a a confluence of dance elements sure on that scene you know stuff like i I know liquid liquid are american and i know they were essentially ripped off or the the um the white lines baseline is the baseline from from that tune by them and that was not the most comfortable thing but i mean Mm. but what liquid liquid were doing here in 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 the states was lending itself to it was very similar as like the post-punk dance thing in england it lo- it lent itself nicely as a bridge into hip hop. There's a I think there's a it's kind of fateful that that happened, right? Um, because it's not like totally out of left field, and you're absolutely right. I mean, even what was considered punk itself at the beginning was all these different things. Like Blondie didn't sound anything like 
the Ramones, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, mm-hmm. television, et cetera, mm-hmm. talking heads, et cetera, but so on, so on, so on, so on. Right. Absolutely. No, I mean, that's what's so interesting is everything is a reaction to something else. And and that's why I think it's such a big weight, uh, weighted change when you see these bands that span decades, because it's like, great, we found the new thing. We're going to go hardcore with that. And eventually, if we're going to make it, we got to find another new thing. <laughs> we're going to have to react to this reaction somewhere along down the ride. Um, and that's really fun for me to watch. Uh, Radiohead is like my favorite band uh, and and watching them grow and step forward, step back, all that kind of stuff has been uh, super inspiring. I was right there along the change of Kid A and I, as a guitar player who really found some of my voice once I got into uh, the Benz and OK Computer. Yeah, the first time I heard those little blips of commercials for Kid A, uh, a part of me died. <laughs> I was like, oh, they're all like keyboards and weird now. OK, uh, I've, now the record comes out and I fall in love with it and I find, you know, new inspiration and and, uh, you know, they propel me further down a, another road. But uh, yeah, man, it's all it's all about reacting to the last thing, including if you're the last thing and, and you got big, it's, it's time for you to <laughs> find a new path. So I think that pretty much, uh, it, you know, is very relevant for this this album we're talking about. And yes, the, the the record I've been working on with uh, Gamblers, I'm feeling feeling like uh, it's pretty eclectic and feeling happy about that. I, w- I went to, into it with so many nerves. I, I was like, what is this? We are having an identity crisis. Who is this band? And I walked out of it going like, oh, yeah, we all love uh, an eclectic uh, a bunch of bands and, and musicians. And, and somehow that all showed up. And hopefully that pushes this all somewhere new. And we're all the product of this, this you know, our ages, even though I was born mm. in a decade previous to you guys, but it's like we're sure. all the product of this this what you so beautifully described as estuaries, which I, I that is the the most beautiful way to put this, mm. right? Of this estuary, middle sort of muddy, <laughs> watery, mm-hmm. marshy ground between. Mm-hmm organic playing and electronic music. I mean, gorillas and, and so much of yeah. what we've heard is just naturally that sort of built into us. And I think technology can be as human as you want it to be. So many people were saying yeah. when, when electro, like when techno first like beat started to, to become very visible in the culture in like 1997 or so when everybody, when, when uh, it's so funny at the end of that year, there was something funny in spin and it was like um, something like there were like 5,000 articles written this year called is electronica the next big thing, which I thought was really funny, but so many people were saying, Oh no, 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 that can't be, it's not human. It has no feeling. How can it? And then, you know, you get ba- groups like orbital, uh, the orb prodigy, like, and it's like, no, this feels very, this feels, this has tons of feeling in it. Right. So we're mm-hmm. not as like hung up about this stuff as maybe somebody mm-hmm. from sure. who was born in the 60s and grew up in the 70s or even before that. Once you get into the Beatles revolver, like you were talking about, it's like, whoa, mm. what the fuck just happened here? Right. So yeah. I. I, I like that you're encouraging people to live in the marsh, basically, to, to, yes. to let Dive, your feet sink into, into the, the mud. estuary. I love that. Yeah, yeah, good. That's yeah. That's my my message to uh, uh, upcoming songwriters and musicians: get into the the marsh and the mud and find that estuary and and uh, define where you are in it. <laughs> that's fun. And I, and you know, a lot of these bands you talked about trying to stay relevant. I think mm-hmm. a lot of them are just trying to. You just you touched on it just now too, trying to. They're just interested in different things and they have a tendency, I yeah. think artists have a tendency to kind of, just like you said, overcorrect for what they just did. There's a restlessness in creative people that's like, oh, I did this, so now I'm going to do this instead. Like a like a contrary yeah. conversation in their own head, like, oh, you want to do this? I'm going to do this instead, you know, like in the, themselves. And, you know, Radiohead went way out and then they dialed it back a little bit with Hail to the sure. Thief. And then they yeah. go further out within rainbows, right? Yeah. Before I let you go, I'm curious. Talk to me about your experience with Kid A. 
because it's such okay i mean man so i had to write about they they reissued it it was either like two years ago or last year i can't remember if it was 21 or 22 and the thing that jumped out at me was just how much had been written about it at the time it's like this if you if, if like you collect all the things that have ever been written about music or said about music into like one library you would think that like the earth shook like there's before yeah. kid a and there's after sure. i'm totally curious to get your take you know if i have to guess at that big um change it to me i mean this is coming from guitars it's about guitars in, in rock that's what i think because i um I remember falling in love with Radiohead. I was a. Uh, I saw them on much music. My my parents were very strict about what we, uh, what media we consumed. Very religious household. So MTV and VH1 were blocked. But it took a long time for the folks to realize that there is a third Canadian music video channel. Yes. <laughs> much music. Uh, I don't know if it's still a thing. Um, but uh, uh, I remember on uh, Much Music, uh, I saw Creep the video. And it fucked me up. I was like, whoa, this is this rule. This came around the time that I was really picking up a guitar. I probably sat there and learned it uh, and got into th- those two records, uh, the bands to OK Computer. Um, I was in my first bands at that time. And hell yeah, we were emulating um, Radiohead. And um, and you could because it was us guys with uh, with guitars and these are guitar songs. And yes, uh, there was some interesting new um, synthy and computer based digital soundscape scre- uh, creeping all over. Um, uh, OK, computer. Um, and that just caused us to experiment more in the studio. Um, this is a band that I was in that was called Edison Glass. Mm-hmm. And we were obsessed with at that time. uh uh, probably because at the soundscape around our hometown, all the shows we were playing in Long Island in the th- late nineties, it was hardcore and emo everywhere. And it was fun. It was, it was a, it was a crazy scene to be a part of, but also once you see too much of the same thing, you're like, all right, where's my voice in all this? I'm getting lost. So, um, Radiohead was like my Beatles early on. And my experience with the the change moment there was I had somehow started to sneak some MTV and I think people at the time would remember would remember this that there started being these little like blips. They were commercials for the new Radiohead album, but they they were not. They were very artistically done. It was just like a bunch of this weird Stanley Donwood art animation and maybe audio clips. And uh, the first thing I rec- I recognized was um, uh, everything in its right place. Like they kind of played the intro of that song, whatever it was, a thirty second clip. You just hear that. Maybe somewhere it says Radiohead has a new album coming out. It's, it's barely a commercial. It's just like an, an art mashup. And yeah, like I said, I kind of I think I my stomach st- stomach sunk a little just because I was like, what is this? I this this band I've been ripping off forever. I can't rip them off anymore. <laughs> um, but now I remember my first experience listening to that record. I visited a bandmate of mine who was uh, had gone off and, and went to college in the Midwest. And we had a long drive. We drove from Tulsa, Oklahoma, back to New York, which is about a 24 hour drive. And we did it with no stops. And this is the days of CDs. So we had uh, we had in there, um, you know, Kid A. And this is my first real time sitting down and listening to the record and listen to it on repeat. So it was a strange. This is one of the first times I was driving, too. So it was long stretches of driving. Um in the night being scared and hearing this extremely haunting um uh, like droney record and so it became more of a visceral experience and before i was listening to radiohead and listening to the guitar parts and how did they get how did johnny get that sound um how did they play that part so i was kind of in an analytical place always listening and this i couldn't even figure it out so i was just lost in it it was just more of an emotional experience I can remember the sounds and feelings and all of it. Um, I went kind of crazy by the end of that drive. We didn't stop, like I said. So I was like delirious by the time we got back to Long Island. I had listened and really um, connecting with the line. I'm not here. This isn't happening. Being sung over and over. 
Um, it, it came right at the time where I was starting to really get into Bjork and explore her sort of soundscape. So to me, it opened up, um, you know, we, we I just mentioned how uh, songwriting a lot of times was couple couple people sitting in a room with actual instruments and playing for each other. This really further propelled uh, me and and my band and musical uh, uh, friends at the time to explore soundscapes we hadn't before. Um, it I thought of electronic music before that. I thought of it as just dance music, which mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in. And now I was like, no, no, you can do anything with this. You can bend natural things in supernatural ways. Um, and really then, I think what really put it over the top for me was seeing their live performances, probably the SNL performance where they did um, National, uh, Anthem. Na National Anthem. I believe they did Idiotech. Um, and it's like, oh, hell yeah. They, they have like analog technology on stage that they're plugging and blah. Who knows? Half of it may have just been a show and there's just a track playing somewhere. But I was like, oh, wow. OK, Johnny Greenwood, who's my hero, like he taught me to get into effects pedals. And now the effects pedals are just these things that aren't even guitars. He's got like gear that I have not explored yet. And he's integrated that into their live sound in a human way you, where you could see them turning on and off the samples. Um, so that was big to me because to this day, I still can't stand watching a DJ or somebody press play on an iPod and do nothing. I love to see if you're, if, if you're making electronic music, I want to see something on stage representing I'm turning this part on at least. Um, so that was the first time I saw, okay, you can integrate all these different sounds and varying sounds. And it just opened up a whole new world to me. But to me, yeah, to think, thinking about what that giant divide is, is that rock and roll had been so defined by guitar and drums and this record was not sitting on those uh, on those. It wasn't resting on. Let's come up with a a hooky melody, a guitar riff, and an exciting drum part. It was just like I don't know. What if we took all those things out of the formula? Can we still be creative and come up with something great? Um, and just like we've been saying, if you hear interviews with Tom York about that era, he didn't say how can I keep up with things? How can I enter into the new millennium with electronic music? He was like. I couldn't write rock songs on guitar anymore. We just toured the hell out of the last two records. And uh, I can't, I, I can't find it in me to come up with something else that sounds like that. You see that legacy get carried on with other bands, Coldplay, Travis, things like that. And that's all still there. And we fo we followed on with that in those bands. We were like, Oh, cool. This is, this reminds me of the bends um, stuff like that. But um, God, I, I, it just, that, that change from, okay computer to kid a and also for me as a kid uh listening to u2 my parents would allow that watching the change from like Joshua you know Am to america Joshua yes to exactly Octone. yeah Octone yeah. baby i was like oh bands can do that bands aren't mm -hmm. just a sound um and so that challenged me and and here i am you know i'm uh decades later a musician who i i i have to constantly reinvent myself working with new bands and new projects that's all i want to do <laughs> uh, yeah i love it it was huge hugely inspiring um and challenging and hey we all came out on the other side of that challenge everyone's alive uh, you know music didn't die the sound <laughs> the uh you know it's all still alive. We're all still here. It's okay. We can we can handle these big changes <laughs> culturally. Yeah, and sort of take them in stride, right? As radical as they feel in the moment, it's eventually going to settle back into a place where people are going to draw from those things. And some people are going to take it further out, right? For whatever the next thing is. Sure. But then people are going to bring those things back into the middle in a way that, mm -hmm. that kind of... Um, Enfolds whatever seems like such a, a huge departure from all of our collective sensibility. Now mm -hmm. it's now every, like so much of what like that album was so influential that it's almost commonplace to hear people doing things like that now. It just spread yep. <laughs> so 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 much. It just seeped into the like our shared consciousness in a way. It's interesting you mention that you heard that record on a drive for the first time all yeah. the way through. I heard it at home, but I associate mm -hmm. it with drives. I was taking with my then girlfriend in her car down to New York 
from mm-hmm. up here in Rochester and we were driving through Pennsylvania. There's this beautiful part of Pennsylvania where you're driving on a- route 81 mm-hmm. and there, and we were going home for, I think it was Thanksgiving or something. And there was mist in the Hills in, in all those green rolling Pennsylvania Hills. And I always, so I wasn't, it wasn't a night drive and I didn't have any apprehension. It was just so sublime. And there's that one moment on that record to me that is honestly one of the most magnificent, majestic moments in any music that I've ever heard. It's the transition from what is, what are the, I don't even know the names of the two songs, but it's like two songs, this transition between these two songs that is just so I, I, beautiful isn't even a word. And I always see the mist in those hills when I Oof. hear that. It's just the perfect uh, setting. And we were listening and not yeah. talking much, just letting the whole album play. Uh, just yeah. the perfect. We got to bring the CD. Very eth- ethereal. It's moody. It's surreal. Yeah. It's uh, that's, that's, you know, I'll say that from, from a guitar perspective, like the, the classic rock and roll drums and guitar is very earthy and grounding and in my body. But when they take it to those other places that are beyond that, it's more supernatural. It's lifting me out of it. It's more of a, you know, emotional place. Um, hell yeah. And what were you scared of on that drive? Uh, it was, like I said, I probably, I don't even know if I had my full license. This was truly one of the first times I was driving. So I had driven around little suburban Long Island but I hadn't driven uh, on the interstate highways next to like at night, you know, you're doing overnight drives. Sometimes it's just you and truckers mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and I was nothing. being passed by these giant semis and nothing yeah, in the and Midwest. Nothing in that, in, right. In that part of the, the country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I became, I became frightened that I had like, I was entranced by that line. I'm not here. This isn't happening. I was like, dude, is this even my, my, my one partner in the car was asleep and I'm like, man, is this even real, man? <laughs> I had funny. one of those real delirious moments. <laughs> right. It was a combination of the, the power of the music and you yeah. not sleeping, like lack of sleep and <laughs> coming together. <laughs> like, yeah. I should have saved that for amnesiac. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, so what are you up to lately? What, you know, what, what, where can people find, Sure. What you know? What you're doing? Uh, I'm actually about to. I'm about to take off uh, in a few minutes here for a gamblers rehearsal. We're getting a, uh, getting a getting the live act together. But really, yeah. If you want to follow me, I have uh, the gamblers record is coming out. I, I I'm not going to say much, but um, I would say look in the uh, in the following months going into the winter. Uh, you'll probably hear some singles from the new record. Um, those are all the usual places. So follow us, gamblers. I know it's hard uh, SEO, but gamblers baby on most of the accounts go on spotify find gamblers and uh and follow because we're going to be dropping some interesting new exciting songs that are interesting and new and exciting (laughs) that sounds great that sounds great and for people following this channel you can follow all my stuff at feedbackdef.substack.com so listen thanks for joining me jimmy this is really a real pleasure man no it was really fun revisiting this this was one of my less listen to yes album so it was it was like re it was like reconnecting with a lot of all this it was really good i guess for me because the class the 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 prog rock slash classic rock era was always in the past in my mind yeah i get very powerful sensations from when i heard those classic records in the 80s and the 90s but living through the moments and just You know, it's another one of those songs that was just everywhere, that was just part of you're drinking in this atmosphere and you're not even noticing the changes in hairstyles and and Mm -hmm. graphics and typeface and like VHS style fonts and things like that. You're not noticing (laughs) that as it's happening. And then later you it's it's just so branded into your to your memory. And it's such a it's just a beautiful song, I think. Something about it just makes my hair stand up. Ah, uh, um, hell yeah. Even that little dun, 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 like the little things underneath. It's a it's right. a it's a gorgeous painting of sound. That is that'll do it for this episode of Geekin with Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um yeah, have a great rehearsal and uh, you know, 
Hope to talk to you again sometime soon.